how did you get into acting? Well, I, I, gosh, I, um, I think when I was 10 years old, my parents enrolled me in a creative drama class on Saturday mornings at my right. school. So that's how it started. Um, I uh, ended up going to um, university and my, when I, it came time to pick my major on my application form, I chose pre-med. My dad was a doctor and his father was right. a doctor and I have an uncle who was a doctor and two cousins are doctors and my middle sister is a doctor, oh, wow. you know, the medical yeah. family. So that was preordained that I would uh, uh, go to medical school. But I also noticed that drama was an option, so I checked that too. And I think it was the first drama pre-med double major at my university. Um, oh, wow. And I, I never got around, I did all the pre-med courses, but I never got around to applying for medical school. Um, mm -hmm. I transferred to a bigger university to, to sort of study theater, had a bigger theater program. And, um, <clears throat> but I didn't really have a career. I mean, I had a bit of a career as an actor <clears throat> when I graduated, but it was pretty piecemeal kind of stuff. But I really broke into um, the professional world as a writer. I went to graduate school in film and I, I didn't have a, um, you know, I didn't have a movie camera. I didn't have uh, a, an uncle who was a movie producer, uh, but I had a typewriter. I mean, that's how old I am. And so I wrote a script as a means of applying to this uh, graduate program in film yeah. and I got in. And one of the instructors was a, a television producer. So I gave him um, my little script. It wasn't even a feature length script. It was maybe 40 pages. And, uh, and he liked it enough to uh, invite me to apply uh, to watch a pilot that he had produced and, you know, pitch an idea for an episode. And that's what happened. I, I went to the network and they locked me in a room and made me watch the pilot. And I came up with an idea for a, for an episode by the time they unlocked the door and, um, and I sold the pitch. And that's how I started in television professionally. I was started as a writer. And the, um, the second thing that I did was a movie, a television movie, um, that was really, you know, a, a kind of romantic comedy based on my own cultural background. It was uh, about oh, a guy who'd grown up in Canada, who was Indian and who had a, you know, a white girlfriend that his parents didn't know about. And what they didn't know or what he didn't know is that they were arranging a marriage for him with a girl from right. India and, you know, hijinks and soup. Uh, and that movie was going to be made, but we couldn't find an actor. And uh, they, they tried, I mean, this is 1982. So there are very, no South Asian actors around mm. Canada anyway. They went to Los Angeles and uh, they came back saying, oh, we found somebody. I said, who? I didn't know there were any brown actors in Los Angeles. And they said, yes, his name is Howie Mandel. Well, <laughs> Howie Mandel is a, a Jewish comedian and yeah. not particularly South Asian. But they were going to paint him brown and you know it was oh my god oh, what are you no. doing? anyway uh they decided not to do that and that movie was going to be canceled so i begged them to let me audition um and mm -hmm. i got the part and that's how i started acting and so since then i've worked as a writer and as an actor then as a, i worked as a director and you know between the three I'm, i made a living over the years oh wow that's kind of cool how it it sprang from one creative art into another well and that's something i i had to do in other words mm. i couldn't afford not to be a writer or you know a director or you know i had to do all three because i never really i mean there were many years where i didn't make a living in one of them but between the three i did yeah. right and so i didn't have to be a waiter or something because you know if the writing was down i had an acting job if the acting was down i had a writing job and you know, um, lately it's been, you know, a, a bit steadier than that. But, you know, it was a way for me to have a career in the arts was was yeah. having a diversified skill set. Uh, and um, and that's how I was able to really survive 
it it makes me realize that they're all the same job right you know, it, it's all storytelling yeah. and it, when i work as a writer i'm storytelling on paper uh when i work as an actor i'm storytelling in front of the camera and because i have a background as a writer i'm a really good collaborator with a director and a screenwriter because i know what we're trying to do right yeah and and uh you know if you're directing your storytelling with the camera if you're editing i mean that's storytelling and frankly after doing this for this long i i maintain that every job is really boils down to storytelling i mean if you're a costume designer you are telling the story through wardrobe and yeah. if you don't understand storytelling uh you you can't do your job correctly now i'm i'm not saying that all costume designers are writers or anything but i am yeah. saying that all good costume designers understand story and that really if i had a choice uh, if I could put on my passport what my profession was, I'd put professional storyteller. Um, right. And and each of the different hats, whether it's writing, acting, directing, whatever, they're just different hats for the same same job. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Uh, that kind of links to what I was going to ask is, so obviously you've done, like you said, you've got a very diverse set of skills. Do you think you prefer writing to acting, or do you prefer one one over the other? Well, I would say that I am a writer first. Right. Um, but you know, I love acting, yeah. and and directing is certainly what I wish I could do more than the other two, just because it's the most fun. Um, but. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's hard to say if I prefer it anymore. Like, uh, really, it's about what the particular project is. And and you know, I I used to you know I'm one of the original writers of the of the iconic Muppet TV series Fraggle Rock. Well, hmm. there's no opportunity for me to be a actor in that. I mean, that was pure yeah. writing for me, and that was the greatest job I ever had. Um, but you know, I've also written. Uh, TV shows where I ended up acting like that movie or other things since then and that's it's very difficult to say oh gee I preferred the writing part of this job to the acting part of the, the same job you know yeah um, I'm just very lucky that I get to do them uh, yeah uh, you know most people you know it's a it's a tough business and and to be able to do any of those jobs for money um, I'm very grateful so uh, so no I don't have a preference other than I want to work on something worth doing with people who know what they're doing and uh, and have a good you know artistic collaboration with with everybody involved and if that's in the if that's in place then I'm happy so I wanted to talk a little bit about Kim's convenience so you play Mr Meta like did all the cast get on oh we it was wonderful I, I mean yeah. I, I'm still friends with the, all of them and and um and i and you know a lot of this like particularly paul who played up and gene yeah. who played ama i mean we've known each other for years long before we we oh, did right. the series i mean it's a community of actors right mm. um particularly if you're a non-white uh, you really know each other well yeah. so yeah i had known gene and i'd known gene and and paul before paul and i in fact had done a movie together one night uh, one one night <laughs> in a movie together about six months before I did the first episode of Kim's Convenience. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, we basically spent a night out while they were doing this big scene with trucks and accidents and all this stuff going on, improvising our own little movie because we were really not main characters in that movie. Mm. And, and, you know, we became friends doing that in one night. And so by the time I went into... To work with him on Kim's, uh, you know, the chemistry was already there, and yeah. uh, and and I, in in so many ways, it it made our on-screen relationship was really just a an extension of our of mm -hmm. our off-screen um, relationship, and and I don't know if we'd had the same chemistry if we hadn't had that history, and so yeah. that's one of the interesting things I, I think about. 
about a success like that, it's not an accident. You know, like yeah, there is there is a, a, a chemistry that is required that that in this case was due to our history. Now that I mean, other parts of that show, you know, there was no history with uh, Paul and and uh, and Jan you know um, Andrea who played Janet. They just had great yeah. chemistry as father and daughter. But what I'm saying is that it's it's not just about um, the acting. You know yeah. I mean? The acting it's much bigger than that. It's about if you can work together. It's about chemistry. It's about family. It's about you know being a decent person and mm. people who aren't decent people are really difficult to work with yeah. and they usually don't work again you know what i mean mm. like uh there's all this stuff that goes into the the making of us of any anything but particularly something that becomes successful uh, i think that that who those people are as people matters as much as who they are in terms of their talent or or whatever and in the case of Kim's, it was good people who, who came together on screen and, and behind the scenes, you know. Yeah. We had great writers, we had we had good directors, and, and it was a it was a lovely experience. Um, and I will miss being Mr. Meta forever. Oh. Uh, so that kind of leads on to my next question. Um, was there a lot of improvisation on the set? Not at all. Very little. I mean, oh, really? Uh, no, the writers did a good job. You know, they yeah. really wrote, wrote um, with the characters in mind, right. and I was just happy to be able to say those lines because they were so well written. Mm. I mean, once in a while, and it was very seldom. You might throw something in as the scene is ending that isn't scripted, and but I don't know if anybody ever used that. Um, yeah. probably in our blooper reels more than anything else but no there wasn't really much improvising right. it was really it was really a, a good show on the page and I hope it, that's why it was a good show on screen yeah well that yeah because I did think like the the banter you had seemed very natural well I will take credit for the performance you know yeah. delivering that stuff is is you know Paul and Gene were the best skin partners ever right mm. and so we didn't we had an ease of working that i think felt natural and real i mean as you can tell i'm not mr meta in real life you know i don't <laughs> yeah. have an accent i don't speak like that i don't come from that particular background neither does paul neither does gene we were we were really playing yeah. our parents more, you know All right. more than Cells, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And uh, and so the, all of that cultural stuff that we embodied was acting. Mm. Um, and, but I think what uh, what made it work is that that the three of us were, were good enough actors that it that it was real, that it felt real, that we weren't just faking it. You know what I mean? Like it was yeah. coming from an honest place. It was coming from me being inspired by my father, my uncles you know, trying to channel them in that performance, um, being true to my roots and and being authentic with the accent and being authentic with the manner of speaking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the way Mr. Meta spoke, there was a kind of, he would shout words once in a while. Yeah. I mean, I stole that from a, a real person, uh, somebody right. I know who's, who speaks that way. And I just thought that's, that's a, a speech mannerism that I think will work really well for for this character. Um, so, you know, there was acting going on, but mm. I think it was good enough acting in terms of being truthful. It wasn't false, it was truthful. And so, like, and the other thing is I wanna say is that, you know, even though it was a comedy, I don't think, well, I know for me for sure, and I think it's true for the rest of the cast, we were never trying to be funny. Right. right. The the material was funny. We were trying to be real. We were trying to be truthful. And the funny happened through us, not because of us. Now, I say that with a caveat in that I think you had to recognize what was funny about the script and, and know how to deliver it in a way that would be funny. But it wasn't about trying to be funny. 
Right. Uh, do, do you know what I mean? Like it was, yeah. it was really trying to be truthful about the character and the scene and the, and the intention of that character and what they were trying to achieve in the scene. And the funny in a way happened because it was inherently funny. Yeah. Not because I was trying to be funny. Right, yeah, no, that makes sense. I guess that, that kind of, like you said, helps with that, how it felt so like organic, because you were just Yeah, acting. and, and yeah. if the scripts hadn't been funny, there's not much I could have done to make them funny, mm. right? But if the scripts were as good as they were, there's plenty I could have done to make it suck. <laughs> right. You know, I can, I can do a bad job with yeah. good material, but it's hard to do a good job with bad material. In terms of your character specifically, how much creative freedom did you have to the way you performed him? If that makes sense. A hundred percent. I was, you know, oh, that's right. another thing a lot of people don't realize is that the responsibility for the performance, the, the responsibility for the invention of that character is really the actor's responsibility. Right. Uh, nobody tells you how to do it. You make a decision as to how to do it, and then they decide whether that's what they want or not, and they cast you or not. Right? Okay. And so all of those choices that, that I had to make playing Mr. Meta or any of the characters that I've played are my choices. And, right. uh, you know, occasionally a director might say, oh, can you, you know, make an adjustment or something uh yeah, leave a space here or you know it's not quite so big or something like that mm -hmm. but you know that's just adjusting volume it's not deciding that it's a sunflower instead of a pine tree you know what i mean like, yeah. like those choices are the re actor's responsibility and i i'm very i'm very um I take that responsibility very seriously Right. And I'm very proud of the choices that I've made when the character is successful, because I know I did something, you know. Mm. So the way he, you know, the way he speaks, the way he walks, the way he, all of that stuff is is up to me. And I have to think about it. Right. And so even when I go into a fitting, uh, talking about how a character is dressed is about that. Right. And I have a very hopefully a good creative conversation with a costume designer in terms of trying to figure out what is the best way for this character to be uh, wardrobed in order to be truthful to that character. Um, mm -hmm. And and so with, in the case of Mr. Meta, yeah, no, nobody, and, and it's true for all of us, nobody can tell you how to do it. That's your job. Yeah. Do you think uh, your background in writing and your experience in directing do you think that helps your creativity when kind of embodying a character oh definitely I, I like i said i think it's all the same job ultimately it's all storytelling yeah. so that um you know i think i have a i have a great advantage over other actors who are just actors in that I know how to get under the skin of the material. I know I can see, or I can I can deconstruct a script because I've written scripts in a yeah. way that, you know, an actor who hasn't done that may not be able to. But it, but whether they can or not, I think all good actors do it in their own way. Uh, right. And and what that means is that you get under the skin of the material and understand what's really going on. The, the the audience is going to see what happens and figure it out, but you have to be inside it in a way that you can't afford not to be, right? So you you have to know what's really going on and reveal or not reveal as required, you know? But you still have to understand it from this much more fundamental um, storytelling, psychoanalytical, uh, yeah. you know, interhuman relationship basis in order to be present in the scene in a way that isn't um, uh, haphazard, right? right? You, 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 it's, a, it's a really, it's a really artificial uh, process making a TV show. You've got 80 people who are working on a crew futzing around with lights or 
or wardrobe or whatever, uh, you've got, uh, I mean, a scene is told, if it's a scene between you and I talking, you know, they might shoot at 12 different angles for all I know, mm -hmm. multiple takes per angle, and it has to feel authentic and fresh every single time, and also cut together so that you can't do, you can't scratch your head here in one take and scratch yeah. your head here in the other take because they won't cut together. So there's right. a technical aspect to it that you have to maintain. There's an emotional aspect to it that you have to maintain. There's a professional aspect to it because you're there all day doing this thing over and over again. And you have to, you know, can't get tired of doing it, right? Yeah. So there's a whole lot of artificial things in place to keep something good from happening. You know right. what I mean? Uh, it's a very unnatural process. It's a very, very piecemeal type of process. It's not very organic or fluid. It's not one time and you're done. Well, once in a while if they're shooting uh, the whole thing in one take. But most of the time it's going to be repeat, repeat, repeat. You might yeah. be sitting around for eight hours before they even get to your scene. And as soon as they say, okay, we're ready. You after sitting around for eight hours, you got to be, you know, ready. And, yeah. and and present and able and not you know napping uh so so there's all sorts of forces at work to make this bad and that's why it's really hard to do to to do it well but when yeah. it is done well it doesn't look like it was hard at all uh, mm. and that's the that's the goal yeah that is that is really interesting because it 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 does sound like it's a it's a testament to the actors like like you said, it's very artificial. So to be able to be perceived by the audience as being like organic and natural, even though they might have, like you said, filmed it like 12 different times, I think that's very impressive. You have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I mean, I'm on this show now called Transplant, which is mm -hmm. a big uh, um, hospital show. Right. And, you know, that's a whole other kind of thing, but they have to train me in operations because we, operating scenes on you know prosthetically on, on anatomically correct prosthetic bodies that yeah. you know I have to know what I'm doing and I'm an actor I'm not a, I'm not <laughs> a general surgeon but you know at this point I know how to assist on a, an emergency c-section I can milk and clip the cord and the whole bit and you you know you learn a lot of these things I mean Kim's I didn't learn a lot of special skills but I was on a show called The Expanse which is a science fiction show um, hmm. uh, season five and um you know they put so much care into the into the science of that show to be truthful and authentic i i all my scenes were set on the moon in a in a kind of space station set on the moon i had to take gra low gravity training in order to do oh, wow. those scenes you know so um uh, that is one of the things i love about being an actor is you have to learn all of this stuff well enough to pretend to do it for a day or whatever it is, whether it's a, an operation in the case of transplant or low gravity in the case of the expanse or gun training. I mean, I have had gun training when I was on a, on a police show and, you know, um, all of those things are there in order to make it all look like it's not a TV show. So I think American made TV and films, I would argue they're quite mainstream. Um, you know, they get filmed all over the place. Do you think it's harder to find work for Canadian uh, TV shows and films or projects in general? Because they're maybe not as mainstream. Um, well, if you're talking about what we call in Canada, Canadian content, um, right. that's difficult. Just because Canada is a small country and we don't make a lot of shows for domestic consumption mm -hmm. um we do some but it's not 100 percent. we we import a lot of programs we see all the american shows british shows everybody shows now on on tv yeah. however uh some canadian content is now quite uh, popular kim's convenience was canadian content it was produced yeah. for our public broadcaster the cbc but then once it got onto netflix it became a worldwide hit really um, 
So as an actor, you're doing Canadian content and you're also doing a lot of foreign content. By foreign, I usually mean U.S. because a lot of the U.S. Uh, uh, productions are shot in Canada. Um, I would say half the half the schedule of the American networks is filmed in Vancouver, Toronto, or or other parts of Canada. Um, shows you would never even think of, like The Good Doctor, for instance, is filmed in uh, Vancouver. Um, uh, you know, The X Files was filmed in Vancouver for many years until the you know David Duchovny got tired of being in Vancouver and they moved the last season, I think, to Los Angeles. But um, so so we get to work on all of that stuff. So you can make a living working on what we call service production as much right. as you, you know, much more so than on Canadian content. Now, a show like Transplant is a very interesting phenomenon because Transplant is, a, is Canadian content. It's made for yeah. Bell, which is a Canadian network, or CTV, which is what they show on. But it's been sold to NBC, it's been sold to Sky, it's been sold to, I think, oh. 150 markets around the world. So it has a an international um it's an it's it's made for the international market now however it, it the content isn't any different than it would be if it was just a, a canadian show yeah except that the budget is very big for a canadian show it's probably the biggest budget show biggest budget canadian show i've ever been on and i think they knew that they were able to sell it in so many other markets that they could make a show that had that kind of budget because they had you know enough interest in the show to 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 do that so yeah. transplant is a very unique case because it's kind of a, a a hybrid you know it's it's really an american and canadian show in that it is made for nbc as much as it's made for uh, the canadian market um, but it's not um changing its content just because it's uh, on an american network and that yeah. to me is very unique and i'm actually really proud to be on the show because of that because it's set mm -hmm. in toronto um, it's shot in Montreal, but it's set in Toronto. It uses the Canadian health system. You know, there's never any any episode where Trump, somebody's some patient is worried about whether they can afford the operation or not. Yeah. Because <laughs> Canada has has universal health care, yeah. so that's yeah. not the issue ever. Whereas you watch American medical shows, and that's half the half the storylines mm. are usually whether they can afford the operation. Um, so so on that basis, I'm very proud to be on Transplant because it's really a Canadian story that's being told to the world what has been your most unusual or unique role i mean television you know is not a place for extraordinary uh, no, unusual characters television pretty much is doctors lawyers and cops <laughs> so i've played a lot of doctors i think transplant is my 25th doctor Oh, wow. uh, I've played a few lawyers and judges. I was a judge on Suits, uh, yeah, which was over here. Yeah. And I played a few cops, uh, not a lot. Um, you know, when you say unusual, I've never been an alien. That would be unusual. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I have, I, I, I mean, I've had wonderful characters to play on wonderful shows. But to, to, to say that I have ever played something unusual, it's very difficult. You know why? Because I would not see them as unusual, even if they were quote unquote unusual. It's very right. difficult to play a character if you judge them, right? Yeah. So, so whether they're a quote unquote bad guy or good guy or strange person or, you know, the character doesn't think they're good. The mm. character doesn't think they're bad. The character doesn't think they're unusual. So it's very difficult to stand outside the character as an actor and say, oh, this is an unusual character. Because if you do yeah. that, you, you put distance between being that character and, and viewing the character. Now, you, the audience, may see the character as unusual, but the mm -hmm. actor, I don't think should, if they're going to play the character. I think you know, why Anthony Hopkins is so great as Hannibal Lecter is that I don't think he judged that character as a monster. I think he just 
try to be truthful to this character who was an arrogant, full of himself, you know, um, intellect. Yeah. And, and, you know, took, take the value judgment out of it and, and put the, who am I in that into it? So the approach is not, oh, this character's unusual. The approach is to say, okay, regardless of who this character is, who am I that is yeah. in that character? So Mr. Mehta, for example, is nothing like me in mm. real life. The me who I am, the me that is talking to you now. But there is some aspect of myself that became Mr. Mehta. And if it wasn't in me, I couldn't do it successfully, I don't think. If you think it was successful, it's because whatever was coming through me was truthful. And yeah. I wasn't, quote unquote, putting it on or faking it. I was actually Mr. Meta, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever that means for for you, that's what I ended up kind of channeling through me. Like it's almost an intuitive, instinctive process. So it's very difficult to, to sort of, I mean, I played a hundred, I think I got a hundred credits on IMDb, trying to remember one that was unusual. I mean. I don't know. I mean, they, yeah. they were all specific, I hope. They were all unique, I hope. Uh, because, not because they were on paper, but hopefully they were, but because I brought my self to them and made yeah. whatever they were an aspect of me or made an aspect of me them. Um, and so, uh, so it's a difficult question to answer because I try very, diff very hard not to judge any character that I'm playing. So it's difficult to say, oh, this character is unusual. Maybe in retrospect, but I can't think of any that I would say were unusual. I've been in some unusual movies. You know, I was right. in the movie called Orphan, which uh, is very unusual in that th what you think is going on isn't by the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't play an unusual character. I was playing the doctor. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think I think it's it, it would be too difficult to say if I played an unusual character because I never really judged any of them, and I didn't want to.